And welcome everyone to today's ASCP's Best Practices in Advanced NSCLC Project ECHO video conference series. Today's session focuses on best practices in advanced NSCLC specimen management. My name is Kelly Beimer. I'm ASCP's Director of Learning Innovations, and I'll be the facilitator for today's session. A copy of the disclosures can be seen on the screen. In addition, today's session is funded by independent educational grants from Janssen Biotech, Inc administered by Janssen Scientific Affairs, LLC, and by Pfizer, Inc. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Sanchita Roy Chowhury to today's Project ECHO video conference. Dr. Roy Chowhury is an assistant professor and the medical director of the Molecular Diagnostic Laboratory, Solid Tumors, at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. She'll be sharing best practices in advanced NSCLC specimen management. And throughout the presentation, please type in any questions or comments that you have along the way. Well, first of all, um, welcome everyone. Um, it's great to be here with you today um, talking about best practices in advanced NLCLC uh, and specimen management of lung cancer specimens. Uh, wanted to thank ASCP for inviting me here today um, to speak on this topic, which is very dear to me. Um, and I'd also like to thank my co-panelists for joining me here today for what I hope will be some um, good and engaging discussions because as we all know in pathology, um, every practice um, handles their specimens differently. Um, the goal for what we're gonna be talking about today is of course um, with lung cancer, we wanna manage our specimens correctly so that we can get adequate tissue for biomarker testing. Um, so we're not just looking for diagnosis at this point, but diagnosis and also management of these patients. So it would be interesting to hear um, how different practices differ and how they cope with um, some of these issues that we face, especially when we're handling small specimens. All right, so I wanted to start with talking about specimen management in a perfect world. So in a perfect world, um, a patient has a lung mass and the oncologist will contact the radiologist, tell them that here's the patient, there's a lung mass that we're highly suspicious for cancer. This lung mass needs a biopsy and um, it's not just for diagnosis, but we're also gonna need molecular profiling assuming it's positive. And so in this perfect world, the radiologist will then give the pathologist a heads up, right? Um, they will tell them that we're doing this procedure um, and it's not just a diagnosis we're looking for, but we're also gonna need um, biomarker testing. So um, just so you know, um, not to use up the tissue, just working it up for a diagnosis. And so if this were a perfect world, the pathologist would be present, they would be able to do an on-site evaluation and do an adequacy assessment. So in this perfect world, we would get this biopsy and it would be viable, um, it would be cellular, it could have a high tumor fraction, it would be fixed properly, processed correctly, and it would be adequate not just for the diagnosis, but for all of the requested biomarker tests, right? And so the patient would then get the appropriate therapy needed and would respond to therapy and everyone would be happy. So if this were a perfect world, the presentation would be over and we'd be living happily ever after. But as you just saw, it's not a perfect world. So let's see what some of the issues are. So let's look at case scenario one. So you have a patient with a lung mass, they do a biopsy um, and you have a diagnosis of lung adenocarcinoma. However, when you look at this biopsy, which you need for biomarker testing, uh, most of this uh, specimen is kind of like necrotic. There's like some fibrosis. Um, there is tumor, of course, but it's kind of like at one edge of this core fragment. And that's all the tumor you have. Um, and, and it's really inadequate. Uh, I mean, it's adequate for the diagnosis, but it's kind of inadequate for the biomarkers that you need to do on this specimen. So that's one case scenario. Um, here's case scenario number two. Um, let's say it's the same patient, you do the biopsy, you have a diagnosis of lung adenocarcinoma. However, this is what you had originally on the block when you first got your h &E for the diagnosis. And then by the time you get the request for biomarker testing, you recut the block and this is what you have left. And that's a problem too, because you don't have adequate tissue to do all of the testing you need. 
So how often are small specimens inadequate for biomarker testing? And you'll say that it depends on the number of tests that you need to do. So, you know, if you're going to do one test, it's probably adequate most of the time. If you're going to do five different biomarkers by five different methods, um, it might not be adequate all, all the time that you're, you know, for all of the biomarkers you're going to test. If you're going to do 10 biomarkers and you're going to do three or four different um, assays, um, you're probably going to run out of tissue while you're doing it um, in at least um, a subset of these cases. So it does depend on the number of tests that you will be doing, but it also depends on a bunch of other things like the adequacy of the tissue. Um, if you have a viable um, piece of uh, specimen, if the cells are intact, they're cellular, how much tumor you have compared to some of the normal cells in the background. And then lastly, it depends on how the tissue is processed and triage, right? So Let's look at the first thing, which I'm not going to go into too much detail because, um, of course, you know, this specific presentation is on the specimen management part, not necessarily what biomarkers we need to test. But just in brief, if you look at the current landscape for lung, um, non-small cell lung cancer, um, there's a bunch of um, FDA-approved therapeutics out there, but there's also um, several emerging and evolving um, um, biomarkers that are also pretty relevant that you need to be done. And so if you look at all the things that you have to do, there's a long list of biomarkers that you need to do in lung cancer, right? Um, if you look at the current NCCN guidelines, um, the recommendations are not just for adenocarcinomas or just non-small cell lung cancer, but they also include squamous cell carcinomas where these biomarkers are being, you know, you're being asked to consider doing them. Um, Assuming that, you know, with small specimens, because we're primarily talking about small specimens in advanced stage lung cancer patients, um, you may be missing an adenocarcinoma component. So if there is a clinical suspicion, um, you're encouraged to do the biomarker testing. So um, if you look at the NCCN guidelines, there's currently eight guideline recommended biomarkers, right? And they include like EGFR, ALK-ROS1, BRAF, NTREC, uh, MET exon 14 uh, skipping mutations, RET fusions, and PDL1. So that's a long list of things that need to be done from some of these small specimens. So how often are these inadequate for testing? Um, if you look at the literature, um, there's always, you know, uh, kind of like uh, different numbers that are thrown out there. This paper um, in clinical cancer research um, looked at the guideline recommended biomarkers. And you can see like, you know, um, if you're doing all eight guideline biomarkers, there's a very small subset of cases um, if you see what is adequate. The, the problem that I have with this particular publication is that most of the studies that were included in um, this one used single gene testing. So, you know, they were either testing for EGFR and then they were doing L, then they were doing ROS1. So if you imagine a scenario where you're gonna be testing each of these biomarkers one at a time, you're quickly gonna run out of tissue. And so it's not surprising that uh, such a small subset of cases were actually adequate for all of the biomarkers. Um, we did a similar study at our institution um, where we looked at all of our core needle biopsies, um, all of our FNA specimens, and we looked at, and, and most of these tests were done by um, a multiplex test like next generation sequencing, um, just to see what percentage of cases were adequate for all of the biomarkers that we need to do for uh, lung cancer. And if you look um, at the results, approximately 10 to 20% of all small specimens, core biopsies and FNAs remain inadequate for biomarker testing. So I told you it depends on the number of tests, but I also told you it depends on the tissue and how that tissue is being processed and triaged. So what can we do as pathologists um, to ensure that we're trying to collect an adequate tissue and we process it um, in the right way so that they're not inadequate for testing. So tissue stewardship is everyone's responsibility, right? And, and it starts from the time when we collect the specimen, how that specimen is collected, how it's processed and handled um, will actually impact how some of these biomarker testing will work, how that test is being interpreted. And all of these steps are kind of interconnected and um, interdependent. So let's start with step one. So 
Step one is specimen acquisition. So you wanna start with an adequate sample. And how do you ensure you're getting an adequate sample? So one is optimizing the technique. So if you're using something like image guidance where you can actually see where the needle is, if the needle is in the lesion, chances of getting an adequate sample are higher. You wanna optimize the number of uh, passes you're gonna do, the number of cores that you're gonna take, what needle gauge you're gonna use, and most importantly, the person doing the procedure because all of us are well aware of um, radiologists um, or bronchoscopists who give you really beautiful um, specimens that are highly cellular and adequate for not just diagnosis, but for biomarker testing. So um, the skill of the person doing the procedure, um, the training they have, the expertise they have does play a role. And the other thing that we can do is also um, implementing ROSE, which is, stands for Rapid On-Site Evaluation. So when they're doing the procedure at the time of the procedure, if you have some on-site evaluation, that has been shown um, that um, you can actually collect an adequate sample and triage it for biomarker testing. Um, so to that effect, um, there are these recent guidelines from the College of American Pathologists that actually talk about some of these measures that can be taken in terms of collecting and handling these small biopsies for um, ancillary testing. Um, and um, in the interest of time, I really don't, uh, won't be able to go into the details of these recommendations. Um, this is kind of small, but it'll, it'll be um, given to you um, at the end of this presentation um, in the handout, but um, I would direct you, so this was published in the archives um, last year. So um, if you haven't seen it, um, I would um, recommend taking a look at it because it does provide specific recommendations for the kind of needle gauge, the number of cores, the number of passes, um, the use of rows um, for different pr um, um, procedures like your uh, bronchoscopic procedures, your um, trans, thoracic um, needle biopsies and aspirates and effusions um, are also included in here. All right, so uh, moving on, step two is now you've collected the specimen, uh, which is hopefully adequate. You want, want to optimize the processing part because how you process that specimen actually has quantitative and qualitative uh, differences in the kind of nucleic acid and protein you get out of that specimen. So we often think of all formal and fixed tissue as being equal, but not all FFP samples are the same. And this uh, review article um, actually highlights how some of these different factors can actually affect your FFP tissue. So just dunking it into formalin doesn't ensure that you get a good piece of tissue that will be, I mean, maybe good for your diagnostic aspect, but it may or may not be good for some of the nucleic acid-based testing, the protein-based testing that we do for IHC. And so um, if you look at this uh, article, it actually has recommendations of what are the most optimal ways of fixing um, and processing the tissue um, for uh, FFPE to ensure that you get good DNA and good RNA and good protein um, that will be reliable, will provide reliable results for your biomarker testing. Um, when you talk about cytology specimens, you know, it's, it's even more complicated because in cytology, um, there's a vast number of different ways um, specimens are processed. So once you collect this specimen, let's say you're doing an EBIS procedure, you collect this specimen, you have a whole array of different um, fixatives and preservatives to put that specimen in. Like you could put it on a glass uh, slide, make a smear. You could either air dry it, you could put it in alcohol, you could put it into some kind of liquid-based cytology prep. Um, you could put it in formalin, you could fix it into a block, or you could put it in an alternate fixative and make it into a block. So there's all of these different choices you have and how you process it actually impacts how um, your DNA, your RNA and protein is gonna behave for some of the downstream testing. And this article here actually highlights how you can have quantitative differences in the yield depending on how you process that specimen, whether you spray fix it or air dry it, or whether you put it in cytolite or you put, uh, fix it in ethanol, um, different kinds of mounting medium. So again, um, it's mainly important to um, think about this when, when you're dealing with specimens that are small specimens that have limited 
um, amounts of tissue because you want to maximize the amount of nucleic acid and you want to make sure that the tests that you're going to do are reliable and accurate. So again, um, just to um, mention the cytology specimens, um, in the past, the CAP guidelines on lung molecular testing had recommended um, use the use of cell blocks over other cytologic uh, specimens, but the 2018 updated guidelines actually included um, other cy cytologic preparations. So not just cell blocks, but other um, specimen preparations like smears and liquid-based cytology. Um, could be, can be used for testing. Um, and this was also reiterated in, in the guideline that I mentioned that uh, was published last year. There's a strong recommendation for the use of cytology for ancillary studies, as long as they're adequately validated. So step three is optimizing the specimen handling because uh, this, again, is very dependent on the practice that you're in, the institutional guidelines you have. Um, how many cores do you do? How many passes do you take? Um, do you process the cores as separate blocks? Do you have a molecular only block? Do you cut your unstained slides up front in anticipation for your um, biomarker testing? Or do you get one HED um, and then get sequential recut um, once you get your request for biomarker testing? How many diagnostic IHC do you do? Um, is, is there, you know, do, do you have an algorithm for, you know, uh, doing maybe TTF1 and P40, and if, if that's not helpful, then doing other IHC. So all of those things need to be kept in mind because if you have a positive specimen and you know that you're going to anticipate uh, getting a request for biomarker testing, you want to ensure that you're judiciously triaging that tissue and not using it up for just diagnosis um, or just workup of the specimen when the intention is to do the biomarker testing so they can manage the patient. So um, the molecular adequacy assessment, which is, you know, the overall cellularity of the specimen and the percentage of tumor you have in the specimen comes into play when you're doing your specimen assessment. So the role of the pathologist primarily is kind of making sure that the specimen gets handled and triage uh, properly, but it's also to modulate that specimen for the assay that you're going to be sending it for testing, right? Um, because that's our role. We're the ones who are looking at the tissue. We're the ones who are going to send it for testing. And we want to ensure that the specimen that we're sending is adequate for the test. And you want to make sure that you're minimizing false negative results, right? You don't want a false negative uh, result and give the wrong test result to the patient um, and the wrong management um, that results from that. So we want to map our specimens for to enrich for tumor. So one option is like when you have a tissue like this is to send the whole thing without circling it. Um, and you can see, you know, the tumors on one end of this core and the rest of it has a ton of inflammation. And you know, these uh, benign cells are gonna dilute your tumor DNA, right? So the, the percentage of tumor you have will drop if you don't exclude um, all of this benign tissue on the other end of the core. So ideally, when you're sending this tissue for testing, you're going to circle this area that has tumor, and you're going to estimate the tumor percentage in that circle area and kind of exclude all of the non-tumor cells because that's going to dilute your tumor DNA and can result in a false negative result. So communication um, is key. I cannot emphasize how important this thing is because um, the last thing we want is to start with a tissue like this where they collected um, a bunch of different cores. They look pretty adequate. There's a ton of tumor in this first H&E um, cut. And then when you recut the block for biomarker testing, this is all you're left with. So having that communication between the oncologist who's requesting that testing, the radiologist who's going to be doing the procedure, the lab technician or technologist who brings the specimen into the lab for processing, and the pathologist who looks at it. Um, because that needs to be intact so that um, nothing's lost in translation. Um, so, you know, I started out with talking about that perfect world. We need to simulate that perfect world every single time so we're able to provide the information that's needed to treat the patient. So in summary, I just wanted to emphasize that this goes 
tissue stewardship is everyone's responsibility. We need to come together as a team and to ensure that we're collecting an adequate tissue, it's processed um, the right way, and we can improve the success of biomarker testing if we handle that tissue um, appropriately. So I think that was my last slide. Um, I wanted to focus primarily on discussing different practices because I know um, we have part, um, attendees here who come from different practices and people process tissues in different ways. Um, what some of the challenges are in terms of um, what you're doing in your everyday practice, um, what percentage of cases you're seeing that despite what you do um, still remain inadequate and what we can do um, as pathologists to improve the success of our um, lung cancer specimens for molecular testing. So thank you again. Um, and um, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Wonderful. Thank you so much for such an informative presentation, Dr. Roy Chowdhury. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Luis de las Casas, a professor of pathology at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. He'll be sharing some of the best practices and lessons that he's learned in his institution, and then we'll open it up for discussion after the presentation. So as a reminder, for anybody who has questions or would like to make a comment, feel free to use the uh, chat or Q&A functionality, and then we'll also uh, be opening up uh, to allow you to raise your hands to speak as well um, after after this presentation. So Dr. De Las Casas, the floor is yours if you'd like to share your slides or I'm happy to share them for you. Um, thanks for that introduction. And after that very, ex very uh, that excellent presentation from Dr. Chowdhury, I'm going to uh, share the next uh, couple of minutes uh, with a different way of seeing this process. Uh, what was presented before is extremely important and crucial, but in the meantime, um, especially when you want to start or when you want to uh, optimize the cytology intervention process. It is um, uh, one way of being successful to use the concepts and models that I'm going to share with you. Uh, so during the next couple of minutes, um, we are going to share some concept, concepts and models that uh, I have used to optimize the diagnosis and procurement of tumor material during, during interventional procedure. When confronting with a tough issue, it is very good practice when confronting uh, a difficult situation to focus on selecting the process on how to go, what to do, rather than on finding the solution using reason by analogy, some people call it intuition, which is very susceptible to errors that can lead to bad outcomes. Many times leaders fail because they approach critical issues as events rather than as processes. A process involves a series of events linked to each other that unfolds over time. When there is a desire to create, review, or optimize interventional cytopathology, it is better to frame it as a process that it was mentioned. An excellent option to use is to employ a so-called decision hygiene approach. This approach consists of the recognition of all the various steps or events, if you will, and independently analyze each one. For example, the scope of data collection, you can review if pertinent data has been obtained, such as history of smoking, size, location, imaging characteristics of the lesion, and history of any previous malignancy. Tactful exchange of information, tactful exchange of information with a pulmonologist or surgeon uh, during the procedure is also very important. Uh, knowing that there is an endobronchial lesion, uh, knowing the consistency of the lesion, rubber, grit, is soft, hard. Uh, if a clotted sample is obtained, if only necrosis is obtained, those are things that need to be communicated back and forth. And on occasions, uh, suggest uh, uh, to, to do some specific actions as we are going to discuss later. No? Control of the needle is also very important to obtain small drops for smearing, division and triage of the material as desired. Appropriate smearing technique to pause the procedure when needed. For example, after two or three passes, if they continue doing passes, you don't have time to, to, to focus or concentrate or do certain things that require time 
um, the microscopic exam, uh, if possible, needs to be done with a minimal possible noise. We are going to review that in a, in a minute. At this point, it is important to also pause yourself to analyze what is the message you want to convey rather than describe what you see. For example, um, we got the lesion, look like squamous cell carcinoma, or we got granulomas, or malignant cells are present. Uh, we need a good cell lock, or what I have on the slide does not represent a tumor. At the meantime, uh, we need to be solution oriented. Do not argue or complain during the procedure, but establish uh, firm boundaries on our diagnosis. We need to keep the power over the microscopic exam interpretation. Some researchers have indicated several factors that influence the adequacy of the sample. For example, the prevalence of lung cancer, that is, everybody knows that affects the positive predictive value of the test, the number of cases that improve exposure, experience of the person doing the procedure and the cytopathology team, the likelihood of having cancer or advanced tumor stage where, the, where sampling will be, in theory, easier, no? and others uh, as are stated over there. So the scope of interventional cytology depends on the institutional needs, on individual expertise, and the resources available. There are, uh, there are several concepts that need to be, that needs to be uh, addressed to create awareness of their impact uh, and, uh, to produce errors. Cognitive bias are unconscious errors that all of us have are rooted in human nature. And these uh, errors of thought <clears throat> can cause people to make wrong decisions. For example, overconfidence is one of them. It's a very common one, stereotyping, another one. Uh, then noise. Noise refers to anything that interferes with acute, with accurate, excuse me, transmission of a message. It could be a loud voice, an inappropriate comment, emotion that could paralyze us, or cultural issues grounded uh, in different grounded on different cognitive styles. No? What happened is that the noise caused people to pay attention to different things when making decisions at different moments. <clears throat> Another uh, consideration is that real experts in the field are highly skilled people, as it was mentioned, some operators, some pulmonologists are excellent in what they are doing. And these persons are less noisy and show less bias. Their superior performance is verifiable with outcome data, with metrics. No? But uh, uh, there are some decisions or uh, some persons that are called uh, highly respected individuals um, uh, are um, these persons have a lot of influence and are not necessarily experts on the field. They can be, for example, successful clinicians, but not so good during procedures and vice versa. Um, respect of different cognitive styles is very important, but it is also the clarity of your message. On occasions, for example, uh, we are going to deal with situations similar to what I'm going to describe. No? Uh, a pulmonologist who has performed an EVAS tells you that I have, I have given you tons of material. I was in the lesion. I made several passes and you are telling me that you do not see a tumor. Obviously there is something wrong here. It could be the technique of this doctor or how the material was divided or that the lesion was all necrotic or fibrotic. No? It is important not to get engaged in an argument at that moment explain that you are referring to what is on the slides. Cell block material might have diagnostic tumor cells, um, but do not take it on you. No? Use respect for verbal and non-verbal language, including silence, sometimes pause, and a face of a poker player can help. And these things establish boundaries when they are needed. No? Next slide, please. Uh, critical decisions are not made are not made in a room around a the table. They are often made offline. Uh, 
on one on one to one conversations or small groups. However, exchange of ideas and collection of information is better done outside a procedure room around the table using respect for the cognitive style of all participants. It is not our job to educate clinicians or surgeons, but it is important to create awareness of certain facts. For example, not all lesions should be sampled the same way, and many people know do that, but not, very, not all the operators. The rate of needle movement, the number of strokes, the timing the lesions could be adjusted based on the consistency of the lesion felt by the pulmonologist with a needle, based on the ultrasound appearance, and based on the microscopic findings. So it is important to discuss uh, before the procedure uh, in, in a separate setting, how to provide feedback without causing the impression that I am telling how to do your job. So not all lesions should be sampled by three passes as stated in some articles. Another consideration is that it is a good practice to have ample space in the table where material is divided and smears are made. This is very important. Only what is needed for each pass should be on the table. Once the process is in place, it is imperative to monitor the various steps for new noise or biases by scheduling periodic meetings as well as collect metrics for validation. But preparations can preclude adequate interpretations as everybody knows, next slide. And good preparations made after a good pass and good smearing technique can make a difference. So interventional cytology has the potential to play an essential role in the management of a cancer patient. It is on us how far you would like to go and how much time and effort you are willing to invest. So in summary, this is a, a kind of almost like a low power view of the process. To, optimi to optimize intervention cytology, it is important to frame it as a process. Identify and analyze the various steps that leads, that leads to the final outcome, the so-called decision hygiene, and couple it with formal analysis, retrospective review of cases, and active surveillance. I think this is the last slide. And thank you very much for listening to me. All right. Well, thank you so much for such an informative presentation, Dr. De Las Casas. That was fantastic. So we are going to go ahead and open up to our first um, our first uh, discussion break. So if you would like to um, to ask a question, share any comments, or um, talk about any challenges that any of you are facing in your institution regarding specimen handling or any lessons that you've learned along the way, please use the raise hand functionality in Zoom and we will unmute you when we call on you. You might get a prompt on your screen that it asks if you'd like to unmute your microphone, just click, uh, click the yes button um, and we'll go ahead and, and move along. So we did have a question that came into the, into the Q&A. This is a question from Justin asking Dr. Roy, how often if a sample is exhausted from one block, would a separate block taken from the same tumor be considered as a viable option to work with? And what are the possible drawbacks that may occur between two separate blocks of the same tumor? That, that's, that's a good question um, because uh, again, like I mentioned, you know, everybody processes their tissue separately uh, in different ways, but um, the University of Colorado actually published an article on um, what they call their molecular only block. So when they have cases where they they have a high index of suspicion, they know um, they're working, they're going to be working it up for a non-small cell cancer is going to need biomarker testing. They process their individual cores as separate blocks, and they use what's a you know, a molecular only block. Um, so if you have three cores, they get processed as three separate blocks. Now that does add to the cost and the resources needed to uh, do that kind of processing. So keep in mind, this is not for every single lung biopsy that comes through the door, but it's for cases where they have, maybe the patient had a biopsy that was inadequate for testing um, and, and they, they want to make sure that they collect enough. So yes, so if you do have uh, more than one block and one is exhausted um, from you know your initial workup, you could use the second block as long as you know 
both blocks have an HED that you can evaluate for the amount of tumor and, and they both have tumor. If it's from the same lesion um, and it has the same tumor, um, you could potentially use one for molecular testing and one for your diagnostic workup. But, but like I said, you know, it does add to the whole resource needed part um, if you're gonna be processing as separate blocks. Great, thank you. You know, just, just to add to that, uh, I, I had a case yesterday, uh, or not yesterday, a, a long time ago, where there was a, a lung mass and multiple hyalur lymph nodes, and then they did an adrenal biopsy, and it looked like it was adenocarcinoma. There's some neutrophils and necrosis in it, and I was trying, to, I was discussing with the resident, how are we going to triage the tissue? Do we need to determine if it's lung primary? Do we need to see if it's adenocarcinoma versus something else? The clinical looks like it's adenocarcinoma. And then I said, or you know, what if we cut into the block and there's not that much tissue left and they have to go back for more? So I took it to our thoracic pathologist, Dr. Sanjay Mukhopadhyay was on and we looked at each other and we said, I think it's best just to go straight to molecular with this so we don't mess up the tissue. And if there's a, if there's a question about where it's coming from, we can talk to the clinician then. So I think we've, we've, come, we've come somewhat full circle on how far we go with these biopsies from the diagnostic standpoint. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's a great point because there's always, it's like a balance, right? Like, you know, how much emphasis do you put on trying to decide um, what the tumor um, type is and um, where it's coming from, especially in metastatic lesions, like how many immunos do you order um, to, kind of decide if it's coming from a lung primary versus um, running the risk of, you know, using up all of that tissue and not having enough for the biomarker testing. Or do you use your molecular as some kind of a diagnostic um, help in terms of, yes, there's an EGFR mutation, so it's likely a lung adeno. So it's kind of like, they say like, so do we not need to subtype it anymore? Um, not do our TTF1 and P40s if there is like no um, morphologic differentiation? Um, can you just go directly to molecular because it's so important now to get that molecular testing? So, you know, that, that's part of the debate that goes on. Great. Well, thank you. At this time, we don't have uh, anybody with their hands raised or any further questions. So let's go ahead and move now and ask uh, Dr. Jordan Reynolds to share his ex expertise. Uh, Dr. Reynolds is an, is an associate professor of pathology at the Cleveland Clinic, and he'll be sharing some of the best practices and lessons he's learned on optimizing specimen management in his institution. And then following his presentation, we'll open back up for additional discussion. So Dr. Reynolds, the floor is yours if you'd like to share your slides. So here's a picture of me. No, it was not taken last week. I left the um, mark on here to show you it was from 2008 and it was during my third year of residency. At, this is in Denver, Colorado with the US cap. So I was a resident at University of Cincinnati and I wanted to be a cytopathologist. The reason I wanted to be a cytopathologist is because I grew up in an interesting time in pathology. So in lung cancers, in 2005, when I first started, we needed to know, is this small cell carcinoma or non-small cell carcinoma? And then around 2006 to 2007, people started saying we need to do the P63 and TTF1 to determine if it's adenocarcinoma versus squamous cell carcinoma. And it was around this time where I started hearing about EGFR and ALK and molecular studies. And one thing that I always wanted to be, the reason I wanted to be a cytopathologist is because I grew up in an area where molecular was young and I thought to myself, that's great. We're gonna have molecular on tissue specimens, but we really need to be able to do all this on cytology because that's, that's the only material some patients have. So, you know, after my residency training in APCP, I went to Mayo Clinic for surgical pathology and we had lots of resections uh, of patients. But then after my, fellowship, I went to a cytopathology fellowship, and I realized then that many of these patients would never ever have a surgical specimen. Most of the time they'd have a, an FNA of a, of a metastasis from a lymph node or a distant metastasis, and that was the material that we have to work with to try to get a diagnosis and um, any kind of therapeutic information. So here was the brochure for the cytopathology fellowship. One of the, uh, here's me, this is Dr. Kerr, this is Dr. Shalis. 
Dr. Shalos is a funny guy, so we put the Aflac duck on his face, and I've been using this ever since. Maybe he wouldn't have done that if he knew I was going to do this. But this is a picture of the three of us at my Mayo Clinic Cytopathology Fellowship. And while we were there, while I was there, we had a really interesting, um, you know, meeting called the Fish and Imaging Cytology Group. And I knew about this when I applied for this fellowship. I, I thought Mayo Clinic would be, give me the best chance to combine molecular and um, cytology. And while we were there, we were working on a fish test to do ALK testing on thin prep slides. And at the time, you know, ALK was a mutation expressed in 5% of lung cancers. And I thought to myself, wow, this is almost like finding a needle in a haystack. But if that patient had this mutation, we would be able to treat them with something better than conventional chemotherapy. So while, while I was there, we were working that up. And then I got my first job at, at Cleveland Clinic. And I've, I've been there for 10 years. So here's an example of a hyalur lymph node with adenocarcinoma infiltrating the hyalur node. It's even involving the lymphatics, that's probably how it got there. It was very easy to do ALK IHCs or even confirmatory fish on specimens that we know exactly how to handle. We know that this has been in formalin, it's a piece of tissue. Most prognostic tests and diagnostic tests are based on tissue. You could send it to any uh, company that you want that does even more comprehensive testing and they know how to deal with this. However, what happens when it shows up in a pericardial effusion of a young man with, who, who presented with shortness of breath and uh, you know, they, they treated him with antibiotics because they thought it was pneumonia and then they find out that he has widely metastatic carcinoma. So this happened a couple years after I came and I started trying to work on getting that fish test at Cleveland Clinic. And fortunately, uh, we were successful in doing so. So one of the residents and I published a paper in Journal of Thoracic Oncology where we performed ALK on uh, thin prep slides. I don't know if you can see my, this whole screen, but what we found that with the um, immunostain compared to the, the thin prep fish, there was 10 positives and I cannot see this over here. Oh, and two negatives on, on the immunostain. So because of the pre-analytic factors of the way we were fixing the specimen, uh, we had al alcohol fixed cytology cell blocks. A lot of these ALKs were being negative. And then, you know, we, when we took the thin prep from it, we found that eight were positive. So, you know, just, just the pre-analytics alone might have uh, ruined the tissue for the ultra-sensitive IHC. So now we start doing ALK on our thin prep slides. So going back to this patient, you know, after we validated that test, uh, we, we took this specimen and we got the slide over to the molecular lab and they rushed the case and they found that it was ALK positive. And this is a gentleman who was on life support. And he was in his early 20s. And then two weeks later, he walked out of the hospital on no oxygen because they were able to give him this treatment. And, he, and he's been alive ever since. And, and how do I know so much about the patient? It's because he's also a scientist. And he agreed to give a grand rounds with me at Cleveland Clinic about um, doing molecular testing on cytology. And he told us his story. And most of the fish techs were there. And there, there, were, there were not many dry eyes in the house that happened around Thanksgiving time. It was just a, a beautiful, yeah, hard to tell story for him. And I'm glad that he shared that with us. So in addition to the ALK, what else can we do? Well, with our specimens, we have this little pellet here and in the fluid, there's probably some DNA that we can use to make libraries or we can cut the cell block and then melt the paraffin and make libraries. But we found that the DNA is pretty much comparable in both these specimens. It may even be better in this fluid, which um, you know many cytologists have been publishing about over the past eight, seven to eight years. So in Cleveland Clinic, our cytology specimens are prefer preferentially used for molecular testing. So whenever we have an EBUS or a, um, a CT-guided FNA, we'll put everything in a cell pellet, make a thin prep slide in the cell block, and then we can use a thin prep slide for ALK rate rearrangements. So we can use a cell block for IHC. We still have plenty of DNA in the fluid for um, you know, insertion deletion mutations. In addition, we'll have the, um, the endoscopist put passes directly into formalin and just leave it there so it's like a mini biopsy. And that way, if they need any of these larger panels that companies offer, then that's available for the patient to prevent them from getting another procedure. Why is this so important? 
well, we really want to get the patient to targeted therapy faster. That way we can report on actionable mutations quickly without having to send out. It may also save the patients from additional procedures. And we can utilize these histologic samples for clinical trials that, that do not accept cytology samples or tests that need formal and fixed tissue, for example, PDL1 or these companies that, for, that perform larger panels, or if we need tissue for future test development. So let's talk about another case. Um, there's a 54 year old man, and he's a never smoker, and he had a lung mass in the right lower lobe. Um, he had mediastinal lymphadenopathy on presentation. And they found this on a routine executive health physical. Uh, I, I could tell you that um, he has a, he's a father of four and he lives far away from a tertiary care center, but close enough that he can get there in one day. But, uh, you know, this, again, this is a very, this is very close to me because this is my cousin's husband. So they know that I'm a pathologist and they called and, and asked me what's going to happen next. So I, I walked them through what would happen. Uh, they have to, probably have to go to an EBUS. And one, you know, one thing that I wasn't thinking about was how are they going to do their molecular testing there? So sure enough, they went to EBUS. Now, remember, I mentioned that this is a right lower lobe nodule, and this is a 4L lymph node. So they aspirated a contralateral lymph node, and they found this on the adequacy, which is large malignant cohesive cells with irregular nuclei. And um, on the PAP test, PAP uh, smear, you can see that it's malignant based on the nuclei, irregular nuclei, how cohesive it is. So this is, this is adenocarcinoma. So this is a metastatic non small cell carcinoma. They favored adenocarcinoma. And on the cell block, they did TTF1 and napsin A. That was positive. It was negative for P40, which supported the above diagnosis. And they, they were not able to do molecular testing on cytology there. So they did uh, a liquid biopsy or you know, um, cell-free DNA on the blood and they didn't find any molecular abnormalities. Now, knowing what we know about ALK uh, positive patients, they tend to be younger, never smokers uh, and with, with adenocarcinoma. So I think that the clinicians, the oncologists were wary about what, about missing out on a targetable mutation. So they had to go back. Now, we, I recently, with one of my fellows, did a comparison of molecular testing performed by liquid biopsy in cytology and non-small cell lung cancer. And we're working on the publication now, but I wanted to share some of the data with you. So we had 207 patients that had cytology, molecular, and the liquid biopsy at the same time from a, from a proprietary company, company, and 108 of those had adenocarcinoma. And we had 23 patients that had a mutation detected by liquid biopsy, 6 EGFR and 17 KRAS. So of the 23 patients with a, a positive liquid biopsy, 21 of them had cytology and I cannot see my They had 21 were positive in the molecular, but two were negative. So the, this liquid biopsy picked up two mutations that were not found in the primary tumor. On the other side, in patients that had negative liquid biopsy or blood biopsy result, 184 of the patients were negative, 114 had tumor at the same time. And uh, we found genetic variants in 33 of the cytology cases. I don't know if my face is covering up. Let me move it again. So we found quite a few uh, positive. The, the liquid biopsy test had 27% false negative. And the list of the genes that we found were uh, ALK, some activating EGFR mutations, KRAS mutations, a BRAF, and a RET mutation. So many, the, the weakness of our study was that many of the cytology cases at Cleveland Clinic are done on stage one cancers. You know, the, the guidelines that we didn't have time to go over recommended that we do it on um, those stage three or four cancers, but we we're doing most of them on stage one cancers. And we, we need to figure out if low stage equals low peripheral tumor burden. So we're currently going back to correlate with the lung cancer stage to see if that's true. But however, it was pretty alarming that there was a 25, 27% false negative rate with the blood, with the liquid biopsies. So back to our patient, he returned for a second procedure three weeks later where they just did a core biopsy of that same 4L. It's not hard to do. Um, some, some endoscopists may even be able to do it without general anesthesia. 
they could just go in there and get it real quick and get out. No, again, it was adenocarcinoma, and he was found to have be out positive by immunohistochemistry. So he did not get surgery because it was already metastatic. And luckily, because it's this happened in 2020, there are uh, second and third and fourth generation tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and he's doing very well right now. He's back to work. He's living his life to the fullest. Uh, you know, um, this might have been, this might not have been as good as it happened in 2013, but given the advances we made with tyrosine kinase inhibitors, he's doing very well. You know, I always thought to myself, what if they came to my lab? They would have got the answer right away because we do cytology on molecular specimens and instead of having to go back and wait that three weeks for additional testing. And, you know, even though we, we do the best we can, you, you, the, that's the last thing on the patient's mind when they have this kind of diagnosis. They go, oh, well, I wonder what, where my molecular testing is going to come from. So I think it just underscores the importance to test all available material, including cytology, histology and liquid biopsy for patient treatment to capture any available mutation as this gives the patient the best uh, course of treatment. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Reynolds. That was such a great, uh, great story, great patient case that you shared. We sincerely appreciate your, your time and expertise. We would really appreciate it if everybody could please complete the survey that uh, will appear at the end of this uh, presentation, because we really rely on your input to help shape the development of our future educational initiatives. It should only take about 30 seconds or so, and we would really appreciate it. And our next Project ECHO video conference is coming up on Thursday, August 26th at 2 p.m. Eastern on the topic of overcoming challenges to molecular testing in advanced NSCLC. So we'll be looking for volunteers to share their experiences, challenges, and lessons learned on this topic. So if you're interested in participating, please drop us a line either in the chat or by email at grants at NSCLC, or sorry, grants at ASCP.org. And if you want to claim CME or CMLE credit for participating in today's session, please visit the lung cancer page on ASCP's website, go directly to the ASCP store using the direct links in the chat. And ASCP will also be sending the directions and links for claiming credit to the email address that you registered under. So thank you again, everybody. This concludes today's presentation.